Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Would you like to know a principle that is going to save you a lot of frustration, hurt, sorrow, that would give your life purpose, that will lead you in the proper direction rather than living aimlessly in this age? It's very simple. Agree with God. And do not scoff at the things of God, but value them. See them as precious. See them as instruments that are blessing people because that's what God's up to. When he reveals something, when he's at work, all these things is so that he can bless people. Don't scoff at what God's up to that could bring blessing into your life, giving your life purpose, giving you direction, helping you walk in the proper ways rather than in the ways of sorrow that leads to death and emptiness. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Genesis and chapter 21. Now, what we see here is an account of God's faithfulness. And God is faithful to his word. This is going to be driven hard in this passage so that we need to receive it. And not just receive it up here, but receive it in our behavior. To make decisions realizing what God says he's going to do. Therefore, I might as well agree with him so that I can reap the faithfulness of God that are a blessing rather than experience. See, even when we're faithless, God is faithful. And when we are faithless and God is faithful, You know what's happened? We're going to experience God's faithfulness in judgment. He's faithful to judge the unbelieving because unbelieving leads to disobedience. Disobedience leads you into sin, and sin breaks all this sorrow, this frustration, this grief, this loss, and you know what else? Sin ends in death, an eternal death. And when we look prophetically, there is a relationship between sin, death, and eternal contempt. We don't want to experience God's eternal contempt. We want to be people that proclaim through our words and our deeds life and God's rejoicing. Live in a way that brings about God's praises, not God's displeasure. So look, as I said, to the book of Genesis and chapter 21. What we see here is a fulfillment. Remember, God spoke to this family, and I'm speaking about Abraham and Sarah, and he promised them that they were going to have a child. A son was going to be born to this old woman, this old man, because God has said he's going to do it. Look, if you would, to verse 1. Genesis 21 And verse 1, and the Lord visited Sarah just as he said. Now, two things here. In this chapter, we're going to see that more often than not, when, when the Lord is referred to, it is with the term Elohim, God. But when this chapter opens up, we find the phrase, the Lord. And this speaks about the transcendent God, the God who is not bound by anything that is not limited to anything. God who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and he does beyond what we can imagine. I mean, no one thought that Sarah, and we'll see this in a few minutes, that Sarah was going to have a son. But God said it, and now we're going to see the outcome of his promise. 
Now, another important word here is the second word in the text where it says pakad. Pakad, well, in modern Hebrew, this means to make a deposit, to deposit something somewhere. And it speaks here about God's activity, God's moving. That's why in this context, it speaks about God visiting. But it simply means God is moving to bring about the outcome of his word. And that's what we should want. We should want a good word, which means a word that is in agreement with the will of God. So the Lord visited Sarah just as he said. And notice it says, just as he said. And the Lord did, now we're back to the Lord, the Lord did to Sarah just as he spoke. So this is redundant, and redundancy is for the purpose, more often than not in the scripture, of emphasis. And God uses two words, amar and deber. He said and he spoke. And it's simply to emphasize the word of God, that God is true to his word. So let me ask you something. Do you really believe that? That what God has said and the best place to hear God is right here from his word. Do you believe the promises of this book is true? That what God says, he's going to carry it out. And when is he going to carry it out? Well, that's where we're going. Move on to verse 2. God promised that she would give birth, and he has began that promise. Because it says here, Sarah conceived, that was the first step. She conceived and she bore to Avraham a son. Now, there's going to be a strong connection in this passage between the word son and Yitzchak. We're only going to see one time that the term son is used in regard to Yishmael when he's alluded to. But over and over, we see that son goes with Yitzchak, this child who is going to be born. Once more, look at the text. Sarah conceived and she bore to Avraham a son to his old age. Now, the word here for old age is the word zaken. Zaken means an elder. And not just in the scripture, someone who has many years but someone who has much experience. And with that experience comes wisdom. And here's how many of the rabbinical commentators see this. They see Avraham maturing. And it was only when he had matured that he was able to receive this promise. And that's an important principle for us. See, God God wants us to have much more than we currently possess. When I say much more, I mean that in the broadest sense. Just don't think materialistically, but all things. God wants us to have abundance. We're going to see in this passage of Scripture that there is a a preference for hinting towards the kingdom. What we're learning in chapter 21 are principles that have relationships to the kingdom of God. Things that hint, that point, allude to kingdom things. And we can only receive the kingdom promises when we are matured, when we have wisdom, when we have allowed the experience of walking with God to mature us so that we can anticipate the things of God. Why should we anticipate the things of God? Well, in this context, so we can move and be positioned where God wants us to be. Avraham, it was born to him by Sarah, a son in his old age, and notice what the scripture says, la moed. Now remember, I said that there were hints and references to the kingdom. And the scripture says, that this son was born to him when he was mature, in his maturity, in his old age, when la moed. Now, many of you know this word moed, it speaks about an appointed time. 
one of God's appointed times. And these appointed times, and I believe I mentioned this in an earlier uh, message this week, when I talked about the fact that these appointed times, Paul says, and I'll give you the reference, the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, look at verses 16 and 17. He says that the festivals of Israel, among other things, but let's just focus in on this context, the Moedim, these appointed times, these festivals, and they're the Lord's festivals. They are shadows of things which are to come. And what is he referring to when he says in Colossians 2, things which are to come? He's speaking about the kingdom kingdom things so here's the biblical truth the more you learn about god's appointed festivals what he says in leviticus chapter 3 moadai moadai are my festivals the more we learn about these festivals such as passover unleavened bread the festival called reshit the first fruits also shavuot pentecost also, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Tipporim, the Day of Atonement, and also Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, and also Shemini Etzeret, the Eight-Day Assembly. What we learn about these festivals that all too often most believers that don't come from a Jewish background and many who do that have left that, that tradition, they think, well, that's of the past. No. Paul says in the New Covenant that these things point to the future. They have kingdom implications. So the more that you learn about the Moadim, the festivals, the more you're going to understand about the kingdom, and not just the kingdom, but also about the king. Because it says the shadow of these things are Messiah. That is, Messiah is the substance that casts this shadow. So the more you learn about the festivals, the more you'll understand kingdom truth, the more you'll understand about the king himself. It says, at the appointed time which God had spoken to him. So over and over, we've seen three to four references in these first two verses, just as God has said, just as God has spoken, just as God had declared. At that time, in that way, in that manner, God is demonstrating faithfulness. Look to verse 3. And Avraham, he called the name of his son. Here's another reference to Yitzchak being his son, the one that was born to him, which Sarah bore to him. So over and over, it's being emphasized. Sarah bore to Avraham a son. This son came about through Sarah. Who said that? Avraham did. And it was because first Sarah and then Avraham doubted that we have the problem of Yishmael that's going to be dealt with in a very significant way towards the end of this, this passage that we're studying tonight. Look at verse 3 once more. And Avraham called the name of his son, that was born to him, which Sarah bore, bore to him, Yitzchak. Now let's pay attention for a few moments about that name Yitzchak. Yitzchak means basically he will laugh. And this verb, the sade chet kuf, it's important. Why? Well, it's important because it's mentioned throughout this passage and it speaks about the outcome of the promises of God is joy. So in this section of scripture, when we're talking about uh, Avraham, and we're talking about the joy, the happiness that both Avraham and Sarah has, this word surfaces, what I said, sade chet kuf. It's important because it speaks about a joy, a joy that is natural. When I say natural, you can't stop it. Something happens that's funny. You laugh instinctively. And this has spiritual implications to it. When God's promises are fulfilled, it's going to instinctively cause you to rejoice. Many people have said this term, again, sade chetkuf, it is going to have 
what we could call a kingdom worship uh, context to it. So Avram says, his name, this child that was born, this son, is going to be Yitzchak, verse 4. We see a connection, and this is certainly true in Judaism today, that the child receives his name when he receives the Brit Milah, the circumcision. Therefore, look, if you would, to verse 4. And Avraham, he circumcised Yitzchak, his son. Do you see this over and over? Yitzchak is his son. Now, in a fleshly sense, we see that Yishmael is as well. But when it's speaking here about his son, it's talking about the key to the inheritance, the key to the promise. So, Avraham, he circumcised Yitzchak, his son, when? On the eighth day, just as God commanded him. Now, God commanded people to circumcise on the eighth day in the Torah. And this is a reference that Avraham, the man of faith, this man of faith is receiving Torah revelation. Isn't that important? When you walk in faith, when you respond to what God has revealed to you, you are naturally going to be a recipient of Torah revelation. It is going to be how God moves and leads in your life. And you just cannot look at this passage and come away with any other outcome and you say well wait a second wouldn't it be better to say that when we walk in faith we're led by the spirit same thing why do i say that because the scripture says those who walk in the spirit fulfill the righteousness of the law so the righteousness of the law the law does not produce righteousness it does not make one righteous but it manifests righteousness in the one who walks in obedience to it it manifests. It's not a source of. It's the outcome of. So Avraham did this circumcision on the eighth day, and this is important. Why eight? We've talked so many times about the number eight having to do with uh, redemption, eight being a kingdom number, eight being restoration. So all these things are being spoken of here. And realize once more, if we haven't said it enough, circumcision what should come into your mind just one thing the death of the flesh it's only when the flesh is dead that we can live in the spirit it's only when the flesh is dead that we can live in redemption that is mani manifested it's only when the flesh is dead that we're going to be experiencing the restoration of god that he's going to restore the things that the enemy has has taken away because we have believed the lies. We have gone after the counterfeit promises rather than the real promises of God. So Avraham, he circumcised Yitzchak, his son, on the eighth day just as God had commanded him. Verse 5. And Avraham, he was 100 years old when Yitzchak, his son, was born to him. Now, this is important because, again, we find Yitzchak but no, after, when we study this, this passage, over and over we see that phrase, Yitzchak Beno, Yitzchak Beno, Isaac, his son. Because son is synonymous with heir, and in this case, it's connected to the promise. Verse, verse 5 once more, and Avraham, he was 100 years old. What does this speak to? Completion that which is in its entirety or wholeness. So it was only when Avraham reached this, this completion, this wholeness, him being a man that walks in entirety, meaning in obedience to the things of God, that he received Yitzchak, the, the manifestation of the promise of God. Remember what Paul says, that Yitzchak is the child of promise. It's Yishmael who we're coming to, who is the child of flesh, the child that does not walk in obedience. So he's 100 years old when Yitzchak was born to him, Yitzchak, his son. Verse 6. And Sarah, she said, God has made me laughter. Now, this is that same word which the name Yitzchak comes from. 
And what happens is this. She now is laughing in a different way. She is laughing, not in doubting what God has said, but because she has become a recipient of the promise of God. And now she's doing it not uh, within herself, but she's doing it in an outward expression, an expression of joy. And here again, this word is related to a kingdom expression. So she is laughing and she says, God has brought it about and all the ones who hear, everyone who hears will laugh basically with me or for me. That people who rejoice with what God has done, they'll have that similar experience because of Sarah. They're going to share in the outcome of the promise. That's what this passage is saying, verse 7. And she says, who has spoken to Avraham? Who would have said to Avraham that Sarah uh, would nurse sons? Now, she hasn't nursed sons. She's nursed one. But here's the implication. The promise goes beyond. Why? She is speaking in faith. And we ought to do that at time. What is speaking in faith? Well, let me tell you what speaking of faith is not. Speaking in faith is not saying, you know what, I want this, and because I want this, I'm going to speak faith over it, and because I speak faith over it, God's going to give it to me. That's, that's not faith whatsoever. That is kind of a hocus-pocus theology that is not pleasing to God. No, speaking faith is this. God had told this family that she was going to have a child and that through this seed, there was going to be a nation, a nation that was large, more than the stars are in the sky, more than the sand is upon the seashore. And because of that, and here's the important thing, because of that, she is anticipating. So she's no longer thinking uh, uh, small. She's not doubting God. She says, you know what? Uh, I'm going to give nurse to sons, not just one, but to sons. For I have born a son to his old age or for his old age or because of his maturity. So she gave birth to a son. That is a fulfillment of God's promise. And that's how we need to see this passage of Scripture. Verse 8. Now, Yitzchak is maturing. He's born, and now we see a reference to him being nursed by his mother, and we see this progress, this growth, this maturity. Why do I say that? Well, verse 8, and the child grew, and he was weaned. So he stopped being nursed, and he started eating real food, and Avram made a great festival on the day that, that Yitzchak was weaned. Now, two things need to be said about this, this passage. First of all, there was rejoicing. Avraham saw progression. See, as God begins to move to fulfill things in your life, rejoice. Allow this, this, this process to be one that leads you to worship. You don't have to wait until the conclusion to be thankful. Let me give you an example of this. One of my, my favorite passages in the scripture is when David learned a scriptural principle. Do things God ways. Now, this is because he wanted to do a right thing. He wanted to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. But he started it the wrong way. He did it in the natural. He did it in a reasonable way. He built a agala, a cart, to, to transport the ark. That's how we would do it today, in a materialistic, in a physical manner. But that's not the way the Word of God commands. So it was only after he failed doing it the fleshly way, the reasonable way, the logical way, that he later on said, I'm going to move this ark biblically. And he had the, the Levites carry it, 
with this pole that these poles could never bear the weight, but God is the one who, who, who is manifesting the supernatural through the ark. And they took six paces. Now they had, and we know where they were, they were at a place called Kiryat Yarim, the, the uh, uh, city in the forest, we might uh, call it. We can go to that area today. There's a modern Kiryat Yarim just uh, west of Jerusalem on the way to Tel Aviv. So it's about uh, 12 miles or so. We could say 20 kilometers. And, and just think, if you had to walk 20 kilometers, 12 miles, I mean, how many steps would that be? Well, probably a couple thousand or more. But David, after they took six paces, he stopped, and they had a great time of worship. Now, that's the principle here. I mean, the promise in the fullness has not come about. But we see stages. Give God thanks. Worship him for the entire process, not just the conclusion. Because you know what? Sometimes the journey is, is so important that we can't lose sight of the journey just focusing on the end point. The journey is where we experience God in an undeniable way. So Avraham, look again at verse 8. He made a great, great feast on the day that Yitzchak was, was weaned. And Sarah, she saw, notice, the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born to Avraham. And what was this son doing? Well, this son was, and it's a different form of this word for where the name Yitzchak comes from. Instead of laughing, instead of being joyful, we have this term, which means mocking. So he wasn't rejoicing over this progression. He was mocking it. And this is very important. Because this is the Hagar spirit. Because Hagar, remember what she did. When she had Yishmael, when she was the one who gave child, a son, to Avraham, as it says here, what did she do? she began to exalt herself over Sarah. She put herself, and here's what we call it, she had a replacement theology. And any form of replacement theology is bad news. She said, Sarah out and I'm in. This is contrary to the promise of God. And people want to say, Israel out and we are in. Well, that is that same contemptible theology, just in a different form. So she had that mocking of Sarah, and now her son, with that same character, he's going to mock his counterpart, which is Yitzchak, the son of Avraham. Verse 10, Sarah saw it, and she said to Abraham, as a response to this, look at verse 10, cast out this maidservant, and her son. She doesn't say your son. She says the maidservant son. And this is known as the Egyptian maidservant. What does Egypt come to mind? Two things, exile and the world. The world and exile. These are not the things of the kingdom. No, redemption is the things of the kingdom. So she's got it backwards, that is Hagar. Sarah's got it right. So she says, cast out this, this maidservant and her son. For he, this is the son of this maidservant, shall not inherit with my son, with Yitzchak. Now, there's a play on words. Because when, when Yishmael was mocking, it is the word here, Metzachek. And Yitzchak is the proper way. So we see very similar, but just one letter can mean such a difference. And that's why we have to agree with the word of God, not just take portion of it. I mean, if we look at it from a, a percentage standpoint, uh, Ishmael had 75% of the word. He just made a small change. But this small change brought contempt, and we'll see what it produced in his life 
and the life of his mother. So she says, Sarah speaking, this son is not going to inherit with my son, with Yitzchak. Look, if you would, to verse 11. What was Avraham's response? Well, he didn't like it. It says in verse 11, and the thing was evil, very evil in the eyes of Avraham. And evil, many of your Bibles may not translate it this way, but it's the word ra in its verbal form. And ra means opposite of God's will. Avraham at this time did not see this as, as embracing the will of God. What Sarah said, casting out this woman and casting out her son. He didn't agree with it. He thought this was wrong, evil, against the will of God. And the word me'od is there exceedingly evil is how we could translate it. But notice, notice something. Let's read the whole verse, verse 11. And this was evil in the eyes of Avraham concerning, notice what he says, his son. Now, Avraham thought that, that, that Yishmael was his son too, but not in this context. When we get to the binding of Yitzchak very soon, in a couple weeks, we're going to see that, that God says, I'm going to give you a foretaste, God says, Yitzchak is your son, your only son. God does not recognize Yishmael. And in this passage, when God speaks, it is Yitzchak, which is Beno Shel Avraham, the son of Avraham. But when Avraham speaks here, he makes the wrong, wrong statement because he sees equally Yishmael as his son. Why do I say he's equally wrong on this? Well, look now to verse 12. And God said to Avraham, do not let this be evil in your eyes concerning the young man and concerning your maidservant. Now, notice there's something very significant. God did not use the word son. He certainly didn't say your son. He changes it to the word na'ar, a young man. And when he says to Hagar, he says, your maidservant. He's speaking about this relationship. It's really Sarah's maidservant. But because Avraham, he took her to himself, and he ought not. Of course, Sarah told him to, but she was acting in faithlessness, and we can talk more about this, and we have at an earlier lesson. But it's very significant that God changes the language and does not call Yishmael the son of Avraham. He says, for all which she says, that is, Sarah says unto you, Shema Bekola, obey. It's the word Shema here, but it always demands a result, and that's why it's equally acceptable to say obey. So what Sarah says unto you, obey her voice. For in Yitzchak will be called to you a seed. Now, this is vital because that word seed is related to promise earlier in God's discussion with Avraham in this time of making that covenant in Genesis chapter 12. He also says there's mercy, but understand mercy to a limited extent for Yishmael and Hagar. He says in verse 13, also the son of the maidservant, once again, doesn't say your son, also the son of the maidservant, I will set him as a goy, as a people, as a nation, for he is your seed. So here, God clearly refrains from the word son. But here's what I want you to see, and this is so vital that you learn how to interpret the scripture. Because God is not saying, you know what? I have compassion for Yishmael. I have compassion for Hagar. And I'm going to bless them for who they are because of their situation. That's not what the scripture says. It is very emphatic. 
that you, you, you have to understand when you look at Scripture, there are clues for where the texts emphasize certain things. And here what's being emphasized is that God's provision for them is all because of Avraham. What do we glean from this? Well, it's through only the covenant with Avraham that God's going to make provision. He's not doing it. He's not rewarding the fact that Ishmael mocked Isaac. He is not rewarding Hagar because of what she said when she wanted to elevate herself. No, all of this is coming about because Avraham, God's doing it for him, not for them. Their favor that they found from God is because of their connection with Avraham. And in that same way, if you don't have a connection with the seed of Avraham, that is Messiah Yeshua, you are not going to find favor at all. Well, look to verse 14. And Avraham, he got up early in the morning and he took bread and a bottle or a flask of water and he gave it to Hagar and he set it upon her shoulders. And the, the lad, that is Yitz, uh, Yishmael, and he sent her and she went, and here's a very important word. It's the word vateta. This is the word for, for wandering aimlessly, wandering without purpose. Now, she had a physical provision for this world. Why did God give through Abraham this bread and this water? Well, because they were worldly-minded. They were interested in worldly things, so they got a worldly possession. God gave them provision. But notice, worldly provision is limited. It wears out. And in the end, it brings about death. So she's here. She is wandering aimlessly and without purpose. And here's the truth, the biblical principle. When you mock the things of God, when you scoff the promises of God, when you are not submissive to the word of God, What's going to happen? You are not going to have direction in your life. You are going to live without purpose or simply not a proper purpose. And you're going to be going aimlessly. You're going to be wandering here and there seeking, trying to find, but you're not going to find. So she is wandering in the wilderness of Beersheba. Verse 15. What did I tell you? The water runs out from the, the bottle and she, she casts the, the yellow, that is her son, underneath one of the, the trees. So she puts him there. He's probably worn out. The water has given its hot. And she just puts him, lays him underneath one of the bushes. Now, this is to hide. Whenever things are hidden, it's because something is contemptible, something is shameful. We're seeing the results of what? Him mocking the promises of God. So she sets him under one of the bushes, verse 16, and she goes and she sits, meaning she sits at a distance. She doesn't want to be near what, what her son, Ishmael, is going to experience. And it says here that she's far away. How far? Kim Basically, the distance that you can shoot an arrow from a bow. For she says, I do not want to see the death of this, this son, this child. And she sat down before, and she lifted, when I say before, before this situation, she sat down, and she lifted up her voice, and what did she do? She wept. Now, here again, principles. She mocked Sarah. She wanted to replace. She, she wanted to change the purpose of God into what pleased her, what was right in her eyes. And that spirit, that same mentality, we see placed in the next generation in her son, Yishmael. And what did it bring about? It brought about a life of aimlessness 
a life without purpose, one going here and there, and one brain what? Death before them. Now, we're going to see what God does in this situation as we carry on next week. But I would encourage you to read it again and pray through it and see these principles that I shared with you and discern how the Word of God works in order to reveal these biblical truths. Well, God is a wonderful God. He has fantastic promises, promises that are going to lead us to worship Him in a new and exciting way. See, we have the privilege of choosing. We can either pursue the promises of God, value them, be passionate about them, see their value, and respond to that. Or we can be like Hagar and Yishmael that mocks what God's up to because we think we have a better way, a very foolish mentality that is going to lead you to feeling distraught, empty, and the provisions of this world are going to wear out and you are going to be empty. See, there's many people today that are empty. But when we have a promise mentality, that is a thought process that focuses on the promises of God, you know what we're going to have? We're going to be full. We're going to be content. We're going to have that peace that passes all understanding. Well, I'll close with that. Until next week, may God richly bless you. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.